Ready, Curry. Awesome. Hi, everybody. My name is Curry Sautner. I'm with the National Constitution Center, and I'm going to be your host today as we walk through this awesome class on the Bill of Rights. So I get really excited about the Bill of Rights, but we got to have a special lecturer today. Um, Mr. Tom Donnelly is with us today. So Tom, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Tom Donnelly. I am the Senior Fellow for Constitutional Studies at the National Constitution Center. Thank you so much for being here the day after Election Day to learn about the Bill of Rights. And we're going to talk about the Bill of Rights, which I'm so excited to talk about, but I want everybody to know that at the, the class lasts about a half an hour long. We are recording it and live streaming. If you have questions for the Bill of Rights class, make sure you put them in the Q&A or the chat. But at the end of class, we will wrap up, but we are going to host about five to 10 minutes of office hours today because it is a big election week. We want to make sure that we get your constitutional election questions answered today as well. So we will hang out with you afterwards and talk all about this great, amazing moment in history and the Constitution. So let's first start with all the questions on the Bill of Rights. So Tom, lots of questions on this. And here we're going to list these as goals, but they're really like questions that we ponder and goals that we want to achieve in knowledge. So first, what is the Bill of Rights? What exactly is it? And why did the framers... Um, and some of them thought it was really, really important, the guys behind me. Why did we come up with a Bill of Rights in the United States Constitution? Was there Bill of Rights before our Bill of Rights in the United States Constitution in 1791? How did they come up with those 10 exactly? And were there others being kicked around? And then what is the role of the Anti-Federalists in making the Bill of Rights? And how has the Bill of Rights changed over time and, and changed in the time of COVID? That's all of the questions we wanna achieve and go through today. And I think you can do it. So you wanna start off with the big idea and kind of give us a kind of the nutshell to take away about the Bill of Rights and how we should understand them. Absolutely, and yeah, it's an ambitious uh, set of goals there, but we shall do our best. So what's the big idea? What do we wanna really come away with about the Bill of Rights today? Well, first it's that with the Bill of Rights, the founding generation wrote some of our most cherished liberties into the constitution. The original constitution as written in Philadelphia in 1787 did not include a bill of rights, but the first Congress and we the people ratified it shortly thereafter. It wrote things like free speech, religious liberty, those sorts of core values into the constitution. So that's the, that's the, the, the broadest, biggest idea. But the other really big point to keep in mind is the transformation of the bill of rights over time. The bill of rights as ratified by the founding generation only applied to abuses by the national government. It did not apply to abuses by the states. So it's really the Bill of Rights, think about it at the founding. If the national government does something bad that violates one of your core protections, you would have a claim, but not if it was your state governor. So that's at the founding. But we have a civil war, we fight a civil war, we ratify a 14th Amendment after that civil war, authored by John Bingham, who's standing behind me over here. Uh, but what this 14th Amendment does with Supreme Court decisions afterwards is it nationalizes the Bill of Rights. It, creates, it, it, it transforms it into a national charter of freedom, meaning that the Bill of Rights after the 14th Amendment, after the Supreme Court's eventually done with it, applies not just to abuses by the national government, but also to abuses by the states. Lawyers use the fancy term incorporation, but really all it means is that after the Civil War, after the 14th Amendment, after Supreme Court decisions in the 1950s, especially onward, the Bill of Rights applies not just to abuses by the national government, but abuses by the states. It's a charter of freedom against all levels of government in the United States. You know, Tom, one of my favorite things that we were talking about in class earlier is you talked about how the Bill of Rights states our core values um, and our, it's almost our civic religion. And what I loved about this kind of statement and this belief and understanding is that when we talk to visitors, and I'm talking visitors of all ages to the National Constitution Center, when we ask them, okay, what do you know about the Constitution? What, you know, what topic, when you think of the Constitution, what pops into your head? It's almost always an amendment in the Bill of Rights. That's what pops out. I mean, people are more and more aware of the structural constitution, especially right now on an election week, um, all these things, but really kind of understanding who we are as Americans and these Bill of Rights. But when we talk about that, and I wanna walk through all three of them, just one question before we get, out, get started. It wasn't in the original constitution, was it though? It feels so important to us, but it wasn't part of the structural constitution. 
That's absolutely right. Yeah, no, it, was, it wound up being one of the first things we'd have to do once we have a government under the new constitution. It's kind of an amazing thing to even contemplate today. So sometimes in hindsight, we value things more than maybe we did in the beginning. So let's do a real quick, um, instead of doing a walking tour, you said this earlier, it made me laugh. Instead of doing a walking tour of the Bill of Rights, we're gonna do a running tour of the Bill of Rights because we've got some <laughs> smart cookies in class today and we're gonna just walk you through every single amendment and give you the big idea for each amendment. And then we're gonna dive into the history, where the ideas came from, and then jump to that 14th amendment and a modern question too. Sounds great. We could do it. <laughs> All right, let's start. First Amendment, let's, let's tee it up. So the First Amendment, we want to think about five different freedoms here in the First Amendment. So the freedom of speech, of the press, of religious liberty, of assembly, and of petition. So let's just take each of those very quickly in turn and, and just try to capture the big idea. So with free speech and press, I'll put them together and say what this really represents is America's robust commitment to broad free speech rights. If we think about the free speech and free press today, one, it's protected more by the Supreme Court than it ever has been in our entire history. And the United States is the most free speech protective country in the world. And so with that, what we understand is that the government, generally speaking, can't punish us for what we say unless it's likely to incite immediate violence. So it's a really, ends up being a really, really speech protective rule. Uh, there are exceptions, we'll talk about them in later lectures, but that's the big idea to take, take, take at the top here. Okay, religious freedom, two big ideas there. One is that uh, it's a, the, the First Amendment is a restriction on the government's ability to establish religion. So that's one part of religious liberty. The other part is it expresses uh, the ability uh, or the right of us to exercise religion freely. And so we really think of that as connected, you know, when we're thinking about it, you know, outside of the language of constitutional law, it's really protecting a freedom of conscience, a freedom to believe freely what we want to believe. And so that's the core of religious liberty. Those last two rights, petition and assembly, they're not, there aren't a lot of uh, petition or assembly cases before the Supreme Court, but these two rights are at the absolute core of the American constitutional story. These rights are, were so important throughout American history, especially for groups that were excluded from political power. So if you think about women before they had the right to vote, African Americans before they had the right to vote, but even also unpopular groups. Think about abolitionists, people fighting slavery in the early 1800s were highly unpopular politically, but the ability to assemble and express what you want to say in, in, through sort of like the, the, the mere presence of a large group, um, and also the right to petition your government, to write down the things that are bothering you and the government has to read them. You know, think about it. this is what we did with the Declaration of Independence and right here we're constitutionalizing that in the First Amendment. So the big idea of First Amendment writ large, freedom of conscience, we, we, we end up being able to freely believe what we want to believe and then free speech, press, assembly, petition allows us to say it, to say it freely. The entire month of February, we're going to spend on, on the First Amendment and we're really excited about it. And then we're also going to do a class on the next amendment, the Second Amendment. So give us the rundown on the Second Amendment. Yeah, so the Second Amendment is, at the core is about the right to keep and bear arms. If you look at the amendment, there are sort of two parts to it. The first speaks about rights that are associated with the militia. And the second part is a right of the people to keep and bear arms. And so the big constitutional question is whether to read the Second Amendment as gun rights that are really associated with you serving in a militia with your fellow citizens in a community, or whether the Second Amendment speaks more broadly about an individual right to keep and bear arms, to say, keep yourself safe in your home, to keep your family safe in your home. And so that's the contested constitutional question. What the Supreme Court said just recently um, in, in cases in, in uh, beginning in 2008, so only in the last decade or so, is that we do have an individual right to keep and bear arms for purposes of protecting ourselves in our homes. And so a lot, there are a lot of other questions that, that spin out of that when it comes to the Second Amendment, a lot of contested questions the court's going to have to address in the years ahead. But that's the core protections the court understands it today. Okay, usually not talked about all that much, Third Amendment. <laughs> So the Third Amendment, this is, this is uh, uh, saying that the government, basically, it, it can't force you to keep soldiers in your home, which we may think, well, that's kind of a weird thing to have in the, in the Bill of Rights. And we don't talk about the Third Amendment much. But this is rooted in the American colonial experience, the, the Quartering Act that required American, American colonists to have British soldiers stay in their homes. And then this, that experience was seared in the memory of the founding generation. And so they try to prohibit here with the, prohibit it here with the Third Amendment and really respecting, you know, it, it, it's, it's a, a vindication, uh, a celebration of our rights to, to property and especially to the privacy in our home. 
And I know we're not supposed to have favorites, but I have to say, I love studying the Fourth Amendment. So I'll say it that way. It's not my favorite. It's my favorite to study. <laughs> so the Fourth Amendment is really going to, uh, uh, you're, 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 uh, you know, when you're accused of a crime, when you're a suspect, these are certain rights that you have. And so they're rights to particular things. So persons, houses, papers, and effects. What is it a protection against? unreasonable searches and seizures. The government coming to your door, trying to search your home, trying to seize you and search you while you're on the street. Um, and then the last part is, you know, we often hear about, you know, the, the police officers being able to get warrants. And so what the last part of the amendment speaks about is what the requirement is for say a police officer to get a warrant that allows them to search your home or search, search your person. But the big idea here with the fourth amendment is that if the government wants to search you wants to search your home, wants to seize you, wants to seize your property, it needs a good reason. It needs a reason that's not general. So ge they, there were general warrants at the, at, at the colonial generation where you could just write, you know, basically search everywhere for anything that has to do with this person. No, you need a particular reason for why you suspect that person of wrongdoing. Um, uh, and that's what makes a search reasonable. So the government needs a good reason to search you, to search your home, to seize you, to seize your property. Now, another big one, we talk, let, talk about the Fifth Amendment. There's a lot packed into this Fifth Amendment. What's the big kind of wrapping package around it? Yeah, so this, and, and it, it, it can feel like a bit of a hodgepodge. There are really two big parts to it. The first part of the amendment really has to do with rights, with, with rights of the accused and rights to fair process. And the last clause there has to do with property rights. So what do we get for rights of the accused, rights to good process? Well, before you're charged with a crime, requirement for a grand jury, if it's a capital crime, um, uh, 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 protection against double jeopardy, which means that the government can't try you for the same crime twice. If you're found innocent, they can't try you again for that same crime. Um, there's, the, there's the famous Fifth Amendment, the right to remain silent. That's, I think, what we, when we hear Fifth Amendment, if anything comes to mind, it's the right to remain silent. It's that Miranda rule that's there in the Fifth Amendment. Um, there's a right to, to uh, uh, due process. So the government can't take away your life, liberty, or property without due process of law. This really going fundamentally to fair procedures to make sure the government is treating you fairly. And then that last part, the government can't take private property for public use without just compensation. It's really a protection and a recognition of people's property rights. That if the government's gonna take your property to say build a highway or something like that, the government has to pay you for that property. Um, and interestingly, just a, a, a side note about that last part, why this may feel like a really weirdly bundled amendment. I think the only part of the Bill of Rights, at least this is what Akhil Amar taught me, is that the only part of the Bill of Rights that Madison's really coming up with largely on his own is that final takings clause. And so that, 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 that ends up being something that's in there um, as bundled together with the rest of the Fifth Amendment rights. If you, what book does it, does Akhil like lay out the 10 amendments? Because the way he does that, and it's like, one of the chapters, I think it's the Bill of Rights book. He lays out like, this is why they're at it in like two pages. And it is, it is like poetry. It is the beautiful, so beautiful, so well done together. I've read it 50 times and then he, I've seen him walk through. So it's a really good piece. I'll try to find it for everybody. And you can hear him do that kind of wrap up. I think it's his Bill of Rights book. Yeah, no, that, that would make sense. Or it's, it might be the chapter in America's constitutional biography, but he, he might do it in both places. They look exactly the same, so it's hard to remember. <laughs> um, okay, next, the Sixth Amendment. So the Sixth Amendment, we're still dealing with people who are, 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 are uh, accused of crimes largely. And so here it's especially the jury right. So what do you have a right to? Well, to an impartial jury that's drawn from roughly where the crime is taking place. You have a right to a speedy and public trial. The government can't just you know, hide you away for a long period of time and make you suffer. Your trial has to be public. They can't just do things behind closed doors. So important protections, both, you know, for the accused, but also for we, the citizens, to see what the government is doing in that context. Um, you know, you have, a, you have a right also then to be informed of the offense against you. The government has to tell you what you're being charged with. And then you, once you're accused, you have a right to, to confront the witnesses. This is the confrontation clause. You can cross-examine those witnesses. So it's, again, a guarantee of a fair procedure. Similarly, you can force witnesses to come forward and testify so you can make your case. And then finally, you have a right to assist in a, assistance of counsel. So you have a right to legal representation in a, in a, in a large subset of cases. Seventh. The Seventh Amendment, so this is again jury, this is again about jury trials, but this is not about criminal trials. It's about what lawyers call civil trials. So these are not crimes, but they're where, you know, someone's suing someone else for money or for breaking a contract 
or for you know harming you in some way that's not criminal, and so or or bringing suit against the government for abusing your rights. Those are all things that can fall under the Seventh Amendment. And so the the founding generation, the anti-federalists, were very concerned that the original Constitution didn't include a civil jury right. And so here, right there, Madison's making sure that it gets into the Bill of Rights. Usually, I feel like most fifth graders' favorite amendment, the Eighth Amendment. <laughs> Yeah, and so this, this limits, this is a limitation of what, the, what, what sort of punishment the government can impose on you. So it says, you know, bail. So if you, if you, if you, you know, bail can't be too, too great. Fines can't be too great. But the important phrase that most people know is there can't be cruel and unusual punishment. And so here, again, it's that deep concern, especially of the anti-federalists, but more broadly in the founding generation of what is a powerful government going to do to the accused and then to those who are ultimately convicted at the end. And so this provides a certain set of protections against punishment that's really, really bad, that's cruel and unusual. Ninth Amendment? So the Ninth Amendment is, you know, sort of, I, 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 I think I've heard you say, Kurt, it's, it's kind of a catch-all catch amendment. And I think that's a great way to think about it. So amendments one through eight are setting out some of our most cherished liberties. And what the Ninth Amendment reminds us is that list isn't a list of all of our rights. Just because we haven't listed a particular right in the first state doesn't mean that you don't possess that right as against the national government, as against government abuses. And so this is meant to speak to the concern that if, you have a, if you've written down a bill of rights, it's gonna be hard to list all of the rights you have. What happens to the ones that you don't list? And this is telling you, don't read that amendments one through eight as the only rights people have. Scholars over time, some scholars have, have, have read this as guaranteeing certain natural rights, say, that people have. Uh, that aren't listed in the Bill of Rights, but you can still bring a claim uh, against the government for violations of those unnamed, those what are called unenumerated rights uh, by lawyers. And I love this one because it's like a safeguard too. It's a catch-all safeguard. Um, they're like, okay. Right to privacy would be like a classic example. Yeah, and I think right. there's a lot that we believe in that, you know, you don't think about the Ninth Amendment a lot and people don't talk about it, but it really is in there to like safeguard and assume and just say like, don't worry if it's not written down, doesn't mean it doesn't apply to you. You have these base rights. And then the Tenth Amendment is like the flip-flop of that. It's trying to define whose rights it is. Yeah, so I mean, we've talked a lot in this class about federalism. And in many ways, this ends up being the federalism amendment. This is about protecting the traditional powers of the states. Remember, with the new constitution, we're creating a government that's more powerful than the Articles of Confederation. It's a more powerful national government. For the anti-federalists, the great concern is that the national government's been given too much power. It's going to be just, it's going to have this insatiable appetite to swallow the states and seize all power. States will be able to do little and the national government, which is distant from the people will do too much. The 10th amendment says, no, the states have always been an important, have always had an important place in our system. They've always been the primary way in which we've set policy that, about how we, how we remain safe, how we remain healthy. So many of the things that we care about most, those laws are passed by state governments. The 10th amendment recognizes that and says the national government is powerful but it's a government of limited powers and, that the, and, and it's an affirmation that the states will continue to play a central role in our system. The 10th Amendment, again, it's about federalism. <laughs> it spells it out. Okay, so we get to the, we look through these amendments, the one through 10, and then we look at the Constitutional Convention and say, they're at it after the, the ratification of the Constitution. They're at it after, why? Was there... Did they not worry about it? Was it something that came up during ratification or was it something that like they felt like they already had it covered? Yeah, so it is kind of an amazing thing. We take for granted, we sort of read the Constitution and Bill of Rights all as, as sort of that original. Kurt Lash, who's one of my favorite scholars, likes to refer to it as like a belief in the, the, the constitutional Big Bang. And our Big Bang really mushes those two moments together, but they are separate moments. And it, it is really interesting because remember, at the Constitutional Convention, we had a lot of business to take care of. We had to one say, we're not going to settle for the Articles of Confederation. We don't care that Congress set us here to revise them. We're going to write a new framework of government. And then we're going to have to hammer out what does the national legislature look like? What does the executive, what does the president look like? What does the judiciary look like? And so that's a lot to take care of. There are a lot of compromises, a lot of arguing, a lot of work in a hot, sweaty summer. At the same time, it's not as though a Bill of Rights was unknown to the founding generation. You know, they still thought of themselves and part of the reason why we fought a revolution was precisely because we thought that we had, we were entitled to the rights of Englishmen. Those, those rights written into the English Bill of Rights after the glorious revolution that was meant to limit the king and create more power for the state legislature. 
And so we really thought back, the framers really would have thought back to the English Bill of Rights and the rights that are written in there, rights that are again, meant to, be, meant to protect you against abuses by your government. But of course, also before we wrote the constitution in 1787, we had state constitutions that had existed for over a decade. And many, many, but not all, but many of these state constitutions had bills of rights, had declaration of rights. The most famous is the one that Curry has on the screen right here, which is the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which was written actually a month before the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson, of course, a Virginian, knew the Declaration of Rights very well and it inspired him in many ways as he was drafting the Declaration of Independence. It was written by George Mason, his fellow Virginian, George Mason, who would then also serve in the Constitutional Convention. So it really shouldn't surprise us that as, we, as we're speeding towards the end of the convention in September, the closing days, George Mason says, wait a minute, there are the Bill of Rights. We don't have a, there's no, you know, there's no Bill of Rights in here. Shouldn't we do that? Wouldn't that, I believe the way he put it was something like, if we add a Bill of Rights, it will sort of give quiet to the people. It'll, it'll quiet some of the concerns they may have about a new and strong national government. And by the way, guys, you've got the Bill of Rights guy right here. I'm George Mason. I wrote the Declaration of Rights. Give me a few hours, give me a, give me a day. I can put it together, we can agree. We all know what rights are most, and we all know what rights we really want protected. Just let me do it. And then, at, at, oh, I'm sorry, Curry, yes. No, no, I was gonna say this story just makes me laugh so hard because they're at the end of four months of sweating and smelly Philadelphia jammed into a room together. And then there's Mason like, hello, over here. Um, do you think like when he said, let's just add a bill of rights at the end of the convention, there was like an audible groan that like happened throughout the convention. Yeah, I, so, I sort of read Madison's notes as, Ugh. you know, <laughs> so it, it, it must be in there. And then Edmund Randolph wants to do him one better, which is like, okay, okay, what we'll do is we will, we will allow the state ratifying conventions to set a, 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 set a number of amendments to us and then we'll have a second constitutional convention to which again, the delegates at the end of this really divisive, hard, you know, hard fought process of building a new constitution were like, no. No, we don't want that. And so no state supports George Mason's call for a Bill of Rights. Other of the delegates do. Albert Gary did, for instance. And it's not a coincidence then that the dissenters behind you, uh, Elbridge Gary, George Mason, Edmund Randolph, they, they, those, are, those, are, those are the three people at the end of the convention that refused to sign the Constitution. One of the key reasons, especially for Mason, is that it doesn't have a Bill of Rights. And then so as we're getting into the, the, the so we, we approve a constitution in Philadelphia at the convention without a bill of rights. We send it along to the states for ratification and to, to certainly not to Mason's surprise, what is one of the great objections to the new constitution? So the anti-federalists we know are the group of people who are opposing the new constitution. One of their key arguments is where is the bill of rights? You're creating this new powerful government. You're doing more than Congress said you should do. You're not just revising the Articles of Confederation. You're creating a new government. You're creating a new government that's gonna destroy the states, the powers of the states, and that's going to put all power in the national government. And you're not even gonna write a declaration of rights in there. You're not even gonna have a bill of rights in there. What are you thinking? And so this ends up being one of the great objections of the anti-federalists. Mason, who writes an influential essay on his opposition to the Constitution, shapes a lot of that anti-federalist discourse at the elite level. That's one of his key arguments. And so you see this in a variety of ratifying conventions. And so again, remember the ratifying debates, the ratifying conventions, a lot of them were very closely contested. And so what we see over time, especially in some of these big states, is the people opposing the Constitution saying, you know, so the, some of what you might think of as the swing votes at the, at the convention saying, maybe we can approve of the new constitution, but promise to get us a bill of rights. And so you see it from various conventions, uh, you know, figures in those delegates to those conventions, writing out different rights that they would want in the new constitution, different amendments they want to the new constitution. And then the constitution being ratified with the understanding that the first Congress is going to write a set of bill of rights, send it to the American people to ratify. And then of course, if it really is the proper bill of rights that really does capture our core liberties, of course the American people are gonna ratify it. Of course the states are gonna ratify it. And so here we are, we, I see James Madison on the screen. So we're in the first Congress. James Madison is sitting in the House of Representatives. Um, he himself was a skeptic of the Bill of Rights. Many of the Federalists were. Um, and you know, their reason, they, have, they give you know, two related reasons. One is that they thought the structure of the original constitution would be enough to protect people's rights. The national government is a government of limited powers and nowhere in there does it say like the national government can violate 
speech or press or religious liberty, et cetera. And of course, the American people themselves will not stand for this. And so over time, the, the, they thought that those sorts of protections would be enough to protect our core liberties. The states also had bills of rights, so you would have protections for your core liberties in, in your state constitutions. And finally, there was that concern that if you, if you start listing some rights and you leave some out, we might end up with fewer rights than we had at the beginning, that it might say something about only the ones that we write down are the ones that were protected, not others, which is why we have the Ninth Amendment. So Madison is skeptical of the Bill of Rights, so is James Wilson, so is Alexander Hamilton, this key support, these key supporters of the new constitution. But James Madison, a couple things. One, he's running for office. He has to run for the House of Representatives. And I think he had a, he had a sense that his constituents wanted the, the, the supporters of the new government to, to stick with their bargain and make sure there's a Bill of Rights in there. Um, two, he's, he's communicating with Thomas Jefferson, who's out in France. Um, and Thomas Jefferson's like, Mr. Madison, James, where in the world is the Bill of Rights? And Madison gives his arguments for why there, there doesn't need to be one, to which Jefferson basically says, would it really hurt to have those protections in there? Would it really? I mean, is it gonna, maybe it won't do everything. Maybe we can't list everything perfectly. Maybe they are parchment barriers. Maybe really the Bill of Rights requires people to feel it in their hearts that it doesn't just matter that it's in a constitution, but could it really hurt? Um, and then finally, and this is, I think, Madison's, both his, his, his uh, it, it, it gets to the core of his constitutionalism, but also to him as a tactician and understanding the political process, pro, pro, a project of creating a new America. So we have the first election. Washington wins unanimously in the House, in, in the Electoral College, becomes the first president. Washington, one of the great supporters of the new constitution. Congress goes to the Federalists. The anti-Federalists are routed. So Washington, the Federalists, they have no particular reason to honor their bargain and put a Bill of Rights into the new constitution. But Madison understood that for the American project to work, you had to, you had to create compromises that would bring even the people who oppose this new project into the process, that they may disagree with how we think the constitution should be understood, how it should be interpreted over time, how it should be enforced, but we want them to disagree within the system not outside of the system. And so for Madison, he understood that the compromise over the Bill of Rights was a key way to bring those figures in. And so he takes control in the first Congress, crafts a Bill of Rights, a combination of what he sees in the state constitutions, what he sees from uh, the state ratifying conventions, those suggestions. And what he basically does is he writes core liberties in, he keeps some of the, the suggestions of how to further weaken the national government out um, but in the end, creates a compromise, a, a bill of rights that uh, has 17 proposals in the House. The Senate winnows it down to 12, sends it along to the people for ratification. And the American people at the time ratify 10 of those amendments. Um, and, you know, it's not as though all the anti federalists were thrilled with the Bill of Rights. Some of them thought it was pretty lousy, actually. But it wound up assuaging enough of the concerns. And over time, as, as, as you sort of said at the beginning, Curry, it, and, and uh, the, the great scholar Saul, Saul, Saul Cornell uh, puts it this way, it becomes a part of our civil religion. And Madison understood this by writing down these key rights in the constitution, the American people will learn. They will learn that these rights are core to them and they will use those rights to evaluate what the government's doing. When the government abuses those rights, they will jealously guard those rights, not just in the courts, but in politics. And that ends up being a core part of the Bill of Rights Project. I, I, I love that. I mean, I love that in so many ways. I love to see the, how Madison says, we need to embrace our adversaries and come to a compromise to bring us all together as Americans. And that's like a good lesson to learn every year and to hold on throughout time. But also to, to show that this listing of rights becomes the power of we the people and the strength around we the people as well. And that's why people identify it with so much today because it's our tools, but that's not how it always was. So it's just applying for everything in the United States. It just applied to the national government at the end of the Civil War, that all changes. And we get to talk about my favorite topic, incorporation, next. Um, but it really looks at how do we, the people, utilize these tools to have voice, to have agency, and to have individual rights, not just rights to stop the national government. So tell us about Reconstruction and one of your favorite people, John Bingham. <laughs> and I'm sure I have like three minutes, so I will, I will do it as Yeah, I'd like to. <laughs> okay, so John Bingham, Ohio representative, during Reconstruction, this is the period after the Civil War, Hugo Black, the great justice of the 20th century, called John Bingham the James Madison of the 14th Amendment. So if James Madison's the father of the Constitution, the father of the Bill of Rights, John Bingham in many ways is the father of the 14th Amendment. 
What does the 14th Amendment do? Well, fundamentally, it writes the Declaration of Independence's promise of freedom and equality into the Constitution. It sets new constitutional baselines for America after the Civil War. And for Bingham, what it did, and he felt this so deeply, was that it made sure that the Bill of Rights became a national charter of freedom, one that we can use not just against the national government, but against all levels of government. With the 14th Amendment, with later decisions by the Supreme Court, the 14th amend Amendment then, then applies all of the bill, applies the Bill of Rights um, uh, uh, you know, to all levels of government. If the national government abuses your rights, if the state government, if the local governments abuse your rights, you will have a claim under the 14th Amendment. Now, I do want to say it's not that's a clean way, way of telling the story. We have to understand that over time, the process the Supreme Court actually uh, follows to, uh, to extend the Bill of Rights, it's a case by case, right by right process. And so even today, not every core right in the Bill of Rights has been what we call incorporated against the states. Not literally every right in the Bill of Rights applies to state abuses, but almost all of them have. The Supreme Court's still doing this project. Just over the last two years, they've incorporated two new rights. The Eighth Amendment's ban on excessive fines, and it's also extended the Sixth Amendment's process uh, 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 the, six, the Sixth Amendment's protection for unanimous jury verdicts. So the Supreme Court's still doing this. The ones that are left out still are the Third Amendment, which in part, it's again, because of soldiers being in your homes, we don't have a lot of cases to really test that one. But the other two are the Fifth Amendment's grand jury right and the Seventh Amendment's civil jury right. And the question is, you know, will the Supreme Court continue on this process of uh, selective incorporation or not? But the core thing, again, the one thing to bring, two things to bring home. Remember John Bingham? He's a forgotten founder and an important figure in making sure that the Bill of Rights really is the Bill of Rights as we know it today. And two, that the core legacy of the 14th Amendment and the Supreme Court decisions from the 1950s onward is that the Bill of Rights is going to apply against all levels of government, not just the national government, but also the states and local governments. Awesome. So we have one more minute left and I wanna do a real quick hypothetical. Um, so hypothetical question. So Bill of Rights during time of COVID. So uh, assembly and petition, I think, are my new found favorite parts of the First Amendment. We love speech, we love all of those. But when you dig into the history of assembly and petition, it is unbelievable how our country have used those two tools over time. So this is an assembly question. So during the time of COVID, there has been restrictions on the state uh, state level about how many people can gather. So the question is, is if there's a gathering, it could be a church service, it could be a protest, it could be a, a vigil. But if there's a gathering of over 50 people and police stop that, does that violate the First Amendment's protection of, for the freedom of assembly? So we'll turn to you guys first in the chat box. If the police say you can't have this gathering, this midnight vigil because it's 150 people, does that violate the First Amendment's protection for the freedom of assembly if that town, if that city, if that state said you cannot gather over 50 people? Yes, no, maybe, it depends. Chat box now. Time, place, manner. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> It depends. Good one, Marvin. <laughs> My favorite answer. Yeah, me too. It's like the best parent answer ever, and it works for constitutional law. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I use it in both contexts. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it depends. I personally believe it does violate the First Amendment, but that does not make it any less irresponsible. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that answer. And Colin shared, although I personally don't want that to happen. I think it would violate the First Amendment. Um, and again, I go back to time, place, matter with Matt. So Tom, bring us home with, it depends, break that down for us and tell us how it really works. Sure. It, 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 it absolutely depends. We've seen a lot of cases that raise this sort of constitutional question in courts throughout the country. I think the important thing to realize is like how, do, how do courts analyze this issue? What are the interests at stake? And I think what the way to really think about it is it's placing a, these sorts of cases place a core right against a core power. So the core right in this context is the First Amendment's freedom of assembly. There's no doubt that an order like this is touching on the freedom of assembly, that it raises a claim under the freedom of assembly, under the First Amendment. There is, there is an interest there, there's a right there. The other side though is again, those traditional, the traditional, basically federalism, I would say. It's, those, it's the traditional powers of the states to pass laws, to make, to issue orders, 
that protect the health, safety, and welfare of their citizens. And so it's putting, it's putting, in a, one way to think about it in the most simple terms, it's putting a key First Amendment protection against the Constitution's commitment to federalism and asking who wins. And so we see in a, in a variety of cases, you know, courts come out in different ways. Um, you know, the other thing I'd layer just so if that's the if it's if it's a it's if it's a, a, a First Amendment right against state power. The other thing to keep in mind is courts will also look very closely at the, the, the real specifics of the order of the real specifics of what is being closed down and, and sort of ask the basic question of are, are like businesses are like, you know, groups, you know, like organizations, are they being treated alike or not? Is it, you know, it's basically, is it, is it all gatherings of people, of, of people over, uh, of over 50 people? Is it just religious gatherings? Is it religious gatherings in concerts, but not 50 people in a business? And so the courts will ask this question and see how the specific order works. And then if, they, if it really is treating different groups of people differently, the court will ask, does the state have a good reason to do this? And if, if really you're talking about a first amendment protection, does it have a really good reason to do this? And you can imagine that in the specific context of, you know, are we at the height of a public health crisis or is it waning? How long the order is going to last is going to be something else the court keeps in mind. But there's a way in which the two things I'd like to bring home are, one, don't deny the conflict. Sometimes we like to just pretend like there's only one interest and it needs to be vindicated. But this is a real conflict and a really hard question of the First Amendment versus state power. Um, and then, two, understand that a lot of this is going to turn on things like, are different groups being treated fairly or the same way? How long is an order going to last? It's going to really go down to the details. Um, and that that happened in Pennsylvania. The last court case, it was probably like a couple months ago, that happened in Pennsylvania, and they looked at the law and said it was not being treated. It wasn't being treated fairly, and there wasn't a good enough reason. So they they struck down that um, executive order from the governor. So it's not like this isn't happening right now, which is super fascinating, Tom, that we're getting to see all these constitutional questions and the Bill of Rights in action during this time. What a moment. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the big case to remember from the Supreme Court is a case called Jacobson versus Massachusetts from the early 1900s, which is where the case, where the court effectively said in a public health crisis, we're generally gonna to defer to public health officials in the state government, but a state government, a local government can go too far and sometimes we have to strike back. So it's again about deference. It's, it's about honoring sort of the expertise and institutional role there, but understanding that there are constitutional limits. It requires judgment. You can't escape judgment. <laughs> Can never escape judgment. Um, okay, everybody, I want to thank you so much for joining us for class today. I know we ran a little bit over, but it's a really big topic, the Bill of Rights. We wanted to make sure you had that foundation and solid in action. So we're going to wrap up this class, but if you want to hang out after class and ask any election question, Tom and I are going to have some office hours, and we'll see if we can answer at least some of those election questions. Exactly. Can't guarantee <laughs> we can answer all of them, but yeah. Yeah, I didn't want to promise too much. <laughs> thank you, everyone.